Welcome to the Gardeer webinar on Stored, Com Stored Communications Act, Who Owns Your Emails? This is Peter Vogel, and I'm here today with Taylor White. Taylor, why don't you tell the audience about your background and perspective on the Stored Communications Act? Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Taylor. I've been, uh, I'm an attorney here in our labor employment section at Gardeer. Um, and I've been uh, involved in a lot of uh, issues, advice, and counsel um, involving the Stored Communications Act for uh, companies and, and management, uh, addressing some of these issues about <clears throat> um, who owns uh, emails and, and communications and information um, uh, that employees have used throughout their employment. Um, and one of the key distinctions that I think we'll talk about here today um, with respect to that is um, company-owned equipment and employee-owned equipment. Um, so those are kind of some hot topics that are going on right now in the courts and um, as we'll talk about with the SCA, the Stored Communications Act with Congress as well. Okay, well thanks Taylor and uh, as I said, I'm Peter Vogel. Um, I'm in our trial section here. Uh, but before I studied law, I had a career as a computer programmer and have a master's in computer science. So my law practice is limited to representing buyers and sellers of information technology and e-commerce. And among other things, um, I have been an adjunct law professor at SMU Law School for 30 years and taught uh, courses on the law of e-commerce uh, for 15 years. And so the Stored Communications Act was a pretty important facet of, of the academic side of it. So why don't we get started with the program and let's start talking about the Stored Communications Act. Um, you know, Taylor, when this was enacted in 1986, uh, we had a different angle on things. The internet was, uh, it was going on, but the browser didn't really exist, so it was a different time. But this law was created uh, to protect telephone records. So we're kind of in a different stage as we are now. And so uh, it's, it's important to know and understand and appreciate that if the background of this is from 1986, that is more than 30 years ago, um, how does that apply to the internet? And I think that's really at the heart of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I, I think that I think courts are struggling um, certainly with that and how to apply these older laws um, to to current um, methods of or methods of communications, current technologies, and um, you know there's certainly recent case law where courts are looking at the legislative history of these statutes, um, st the Stored Communications Act in particular, um, with respect to these cases. Um, and, and they're looking at it um, from a perspective of, well, you know, back in the in the day it was for this purpose, but technology has changed um, since then. Um, and, you know, the, the statute envisioned one thing, and, and certainly um, technology is growing exponentially since then. So how are we going to uh, apply these these prior technological concepts that were envisioned with the the way the statute was worded to modern technology? And it's a struggle for courts, certainly. And um, uh, oh, it isn't just for the courts; it's for lawyers to understand it as well. And I think absolutely. that's one of the reasons we're doing this today. So let's talk a little bit more about the act itself. Um, it is, as I say, 1986. It's been updated. A little bit, not that much. The important part is the differentiation that is going to be critical to the cases that we're going to talk about today and understanding how the courts view this is to look at, first of all, it is the contents that are on the electronic communications uh, server, which is referred to as an ECS, and that is sort of like the internal uh, service, and we can liken it to here at Gardeer, our emails are all on our side of the, ser of the internet, and there's no access uh, from the outside into the servers. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is the remote computing service, and that is, uh, for example, in the email world, if you're relying on Gmail or uh, Office 365, that's when the emails are somewhere else and they're stored somewhere else. And so in the old days, this would be if the telephone system was internal to your business and you had your own switching system, that would be the internal phone system. But if you were relying on Ma Bell, then Ma Bell had them, and that's kind of the differential. So why don't we talk about how um, Section 2101 uh, fits to this? Uh, Taylor, maybe you could uh, add some thoughts. Yeah, and uh, Section 21 or 2701 is the is the key section that. Um, 
the courts and attorneys are looking at with respect to employer employee issues because um, what you're typically seeing are employees saying well the employer looked at my personal emails whether they are on the my company devices or whether they're on, they're on my personal email accounts or my personal devices and and so courts look at the at this section that's um, that's on the slide here, um, and, and try and figure out how to apply these these terms that were included in the statute to these these types of modern technological um, uh, modes of communication. And uh, you know the the key uh, the key elements to this are what constitutes electronic storage and what is a facility. Those are two issues that uh, come up frequently in the case law and come up frequently and and certainly in my practice as well when these issues arise. Um, for my clients. Well, as a matter of fact, the electronic storage, there's some, there has been, you know, how many angels can dance on the top of a pen kind of issue with uh, electronic storage. If it is stored on a hard drive, that there are some courts that say that's not electronic storage, or if it's in memory, it's not electronic storage because it's not stored in electronic memory. So that, there are interesting nuances in how the courts have to slice and dice this. That's absolutely true. There, there's a there's a couple of schools of thought uh, with respect to email specifically. You know whether an email is opened or unopened, and some courts say, well, if it's unopened, it's uh, in electronic storage. Some courts say, well, it doesn't matter if it's opened or unopened. It's still on the you know the server, uh, as you were uh, mentioned in one of your earlier slides, it's still on the server, and therefore it, um, uh, that belongs elsewhere, and um, uh, and it is still in electronic storage. So it's it, it's an interesting interesting issue to gra that, uh, that uh, attorneys, employers, courts all grapple with. Well, and of course, the biggest issue, maybe not the biggest issue, but one of the biggest issues for us to discuss today is the bring your own device, because in today's world, there are very few companies that do not accommodate employee-owned devices. As a matter of fact, some even uh, help a sponsor by contributing money to the employees to pay monthly costs of these right. devices. Um, and by facilitating the connection of the BYOD to the employer is one of the huge issues uh, that I think is in the middle of the Stored Communications Act because everybody has some of these devices, whether it's a, a cell phone or a, 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 a tablet, people have them and rely on them. Yes, that's absolutely true. I mean, there, <clears throat> there's a, there's case law um, that that talks about both uh, both with respect to the um, uh, bring your own device scenario as well as the company equipment scenario, um, and they can fall. You know, the analyses under uh, for either of those scenarios can fall under the Stored Communications Act. Uh, we'll talk about a case uh, that just came out in February of this year out of the um, uh, Northern District of Texas um, involving a, a personal laptop. Top uh, and an employee who access some of uh, some emails of her prior employer on her personal laptop versus you know versus the invasion of privacy issue where you have employers um, looking to um, access an employee's personal devices um, uh, or image their own company devices that the employee used and was provided by the company. So it's uh, the distinctions are. Uh, are important. And then other policies, and I guess this may be not in the middle of the discussion today, but when employees and employers have agreements in terms of what rights they have to the access these devices, a lot of organizations have the, the ability to remote wipe a stolen device or just remotely wipe it no matter what. And if they're remotely wiping my family pictures, I'm going to have one attitude about it. Then if they're remotely wiping the employer's emails. That's yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, and that's a you know your your self help um, uh, remedies that we're going to be primarily talking about um, momentarily um, uh, is a very hot topic right now among employers and employees too, because both of whom you know care about these um, about these distinctions. And also, right in the middle of this, only to make things a little bit more complicated, is the whole notion of how do we as lawyers conduct e-discovery if we are not in the middle of looking at the BYO devices of our employees? It is front and center. Right. And there are an awful lot of uh, cases that I think we're now seeing in the e-discovery uh, arena 
where uh, the home laptop or the personal computer or whatever um, is has to be presented and it has to be preserved. That is absolutely true. I mean, I think that's a that's a big obligation for employers. I mean, in, in my world, you know, I'm I'm thinking restrictive covenant cases. An employee leaves or a competitor, you know, starts to take, um, you know, customers solicit customers in violation of a non-compete or other laws, <clears throat> and uh, lawsuits filed and. Practically, um, you know, the employer has the um, obligation to preserve all relevant evidence. So how do you preserve that if the relevant evidence is contained on the equipment owned and um, in possession of your employees? Um, and how do you go about searching for that when you're responding to discovery um, for e-discovery purposes um, during the context of the litigation? Yeah, so I, this is something that is a pretty hot topic and it's probably never going to get any less important, I think, in litigation going forward. Absolutely. So let's talk about so what you refer to as not so hypothetical circumstances. And maybe you could walk us through this, Taylor. Yeah. So, you know, what one of the key um, uh, fact patterns that employers um, in management, HR, um, are, are having to grapple with nowadays is an employee um, – uh, uses a company laptop, turns the company laptop in, and what do employees do on the company laptop after hours? They check their personal email on it. Um, uh, maybe on a business trip, they're checking their personal email, and they click the auto-populate um, option for Gmail or Hotmail, whatever they're using, and they forget to turn that off when they get fired or when they quit, and they give it back to the employer. Employer looks at it, pulls up the web web history, and wow, they've got access to the employee's Gmail. And we know this employee is now going to work for a competitor. So in, intuitively, I think a lot of employers, a lot of managers say, well, it's on my laptop. It's the company's property. I can I can look at this. The employee impliedly consented uh, or waived authorization or waived their, their rights to this stuff because I, they left it open. So I'm going to take a look at this. And, um, and what do they see in there? They see... You know, the, the employee was forwarding himself uh, or herself trade secrets, confidential information, customer lists, was, you know, um, soliciting customers in violation of a non-compete or a non-solicitation agreement. And so the employer thinks, well, I got you. They go file a lawsuit. And then what happens with this? Um, so, you know, what you have here is a, a, a problem for employers and managers, as a lot of courts are determining. Then the flip side of this, though, is, well, what happens if an employee leaves the company and still somehow has remote access to his or her um, company emails and then accesses those after um, he or she leaves? So it, it, the, the law can, the, the scenario can go both ways, certainly. Well, and one of the interesting, there have been some really interesting rulings, particularly the Supreme Court in New Jersey, uh, among others, that have said that when an employee uses a laptop, uh, that is company issued, they do not necessarily waive the attorney-client privilege if they're communicating with their lawyers using Gmail, even though they're doing it on a company-owned device. There have been rulings like that in New Jersey and also in uh, in federal court in the state of Washington. So I think we're going to see more rulings like that. It's sort of like you don't necessarily waive the privilege just because it's owned by the employer. That's exactly right. Yeah, the, their privilege is is there, and, and courts will, will act to protect that, um, as we'll see later, um, uh, with preclusion of evidence, discovery sanctions, um, any number of remedies. Well, and then what about this headline from uh, the ABA uh, that, we, that you located for us on how good or bad is it that uh, a lawyer would try guessing passwords? You know, one of the things that I find in my cyber uh, security practice that I spend a lot of time on is the amazing number of people that use the same login and password on every single system. So guessing it, it is not so hard. It's not hard at all. Or we're IT department, um, you know, they're doing some routine maintenance or something. They issue everybody a temporary password and then forget to um, uh, take that password <clears throat> off the system. And, and employees can still log on to other people's or other their coworkers' um, uh, 
uh, email addresses or email um, using that password, which is an actual fact pattern that we'll talk about here momentarily that was addressed earlier this year. Uh, but so this lawyer, um, you know, in this case, he granted he was kind of a, a schmarmy guy. You know, he, he did a lot of other things that got him ultimately suspended from the practice of law. But what really led to it was, you know, his they were in a divorce proceeding. His client was able to uh, guess the um, uh, the other side's password, gain some um, some very good information, and, and then he tried to use that in the trial. And so at the end of the day, you know, this isn't really an SEA issue, but it kind of frames this nicely that uh, you're not going to be able to use all of these ill-gotten gains um, if you're in violation of some law or um, uh, or other consideration. Yeah, so probably one of the most important cases that we've had to deal with is this uh, City of Ontario versus Quan case. And I think everyone uh, watching the, the webinar would acknowledge you don't see 9-0 rulings from the Supreme Court all that often. Uh, and what was important in this particular case uh, that that uh, is critical here is that essentially the court ruled that if uh, an employee is using a company-issued device, they're not entitled to any privacy under the Constitution. So some of the issues in looking at this, I think, were kind of right in the middle of it for us is that the court didn't address the Stored Communications Act in this case, a 2010 case, and we're sort of left it's still out there kind of thing. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah, the, the Stored Communications Act was at issue in the lower courts, and, um, and, and it certainly it came up in lower courts, but it was not appealed to the Supreme Court, so they only had the uh, the constitutional issue to deal with. Well, here are some other cases I think that you've identified that I think are important, and maybe you could briefly chat about these. Yeah, so you have um, you know, the insurance safety consultants case. This one just came out in February of this year, and and this this is uh, an employee's access using her own device that she had originally used at work. Um, she had set up the employer's email accounts, and then you know of course naturally gave herself access to everybody's emails, um, and then continued to access those when she left the employer uh, and went to work for a competitor. And the um, uh, the Northern District of Texas um, dismissed a, a bunch of claims um, that were filed against her based on this, but it actually did not dismiss the uh, Stored Communications Act claim um, with some very interesting language that says, you know, you're, you you don't necessarily give somebody authorization um, to, um, to to browse through your emails when even if you let them set it up in the first place. Um, and so, you know, authorization is certainly a, a hot topic with these. What counts as authorization, what counts as a waiver of consent or implied consent. Uh, you know, another case came out earlier this year, and this was uh, the scenario I, I mentioned earlier where um, uh, IT department sent out uh, temporary passwords for everybody to use and then forgot to turn it off. And so this, uh, you know, this uh, manager continued to access all of his subordinates and his coworkers, co-managers' emails um, throughout the process. And um, uh, the, uh, the the court um, ultimately uh, the the appeals court ultimately affirmed a judgment in favor of the employer there when they brought a, uh, a stored communications act claim against that manager. Um, so you know what you have in these cases is generally um, uh, are issues with respect to what counts as a facility. As you recall from the from the definition, you have to access a facility, and you know personal laptops and cell phones are not facilities, but but they're conduits to other facilities, such as servers, such as email servers. And then what is stored on those uh, facilities, what's stored on those servers is um, is also an interesting issue and um, that courts are addressing these days. And a couple of these cases here that I've mentioned here uh, talk through those issues. Yeah, so I think they're important to look at, but we also have some other big, high, more high profile cases where uh, the uh, Department of Justice uh, issued a subpoena to Microsoft requesting emails of a an alleged drug dealer and Microsoft refused they were held in contempt went to the second circuit and the second circuit said no Microsoft couldn't turn over those because it would have violated the Irish law because the emails were stored in Ireland this has led to an interesting discussion uh, right now about whether or not the stored communications going to act is going to be uh, revised changed replaced uh, and I think we need to stay tuned. But at the end of the day, I think we need to be looking at 
where are we coming back to 2701? What are the risks associated with this? Yeah, so if you're an employer and uh, you're faced with one of these issues, you get hit with an SCA claim or an invasion of privacy claim. I mean, some of the things that can be that you need to be thinking about is you know all of these ill-gotten gains that uh, you you, know, you might have accessed on the employee's personal account or you know that the employee might have accessed on your account. It could be precluded as evidence. You're not going to get all that good stuff. There are there are damages under the statute that are available, and then to a lesser extent, criminal liability. I haven't seen any of that addressed in the employer-employee context. Context, but certainly damages or the preclusion of evidence or discovery sanctions are, are clearly within the court's power. And then looking back at the same case, one of the other issues associated with it, I think that is important is that there's an ethics concern for we, you know, the, the practitioner themselves as to whether or not they're playing within the foul line. So uh, we're glad that you could join us today. Uh, Taylor and I certainly welcome you sending us any questions by email. Um, and we will post this um, on the Gardeer website, so it'll be available in the future. Uh, and, and if you want uh, any more details, please feel free to contact Taylor or me. Thank you very much.